Being good is the bare minimum. It's not everything and it's not enough. It's the bare minimum. You don't need lots of banking experience to get into banking. It just depends who's hiring you and who you're working for. Bringing people into banking who just have experience in banking is not going to change the way we do banking in the UK. If your manager's not sponsoring you, get a new manager. And so knowing when to walk away when you're not being fair enough is going to help you get to where you want to. Life becomes a lot easier when you realise you can't control everything around you. You can control you and the choices you make. And once you know that, you are in charge of your career and you will stay nowhere that doesn't serve you. Be a person of value, not a person of success. So many people just want to be successful. But actually, you've got to add value to the relationships, to your work, to everything else. Today's guest is a special individual. Tasneem Bamji is a director at one of the UK's leading banks. And today, she walks us through her journey. If you're an aspiring leader, a leader, or somebody who's just generally looking to level up, this is one you do not want to miss. Now enjoy. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of What My Best Friend Does, where we talk to best friends in the hope of inspiring you to take immediate action to find the career of your dreams. Today, I'm joined by the Director of Digital Engagement at one of the UK's leading financial firms, Taz. What's Taz's name? What do you prefer? You call me Taz. Taz, yeah. welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm really good. Good, good. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. Really looking forward to the conversation. We like to start with a little icebreaker. Let's go. What did you want to be growing up? <sighs> Do you know what? I wanted to be an author because I used to read Roald Dahl books. And okay. I thought, I can write stuff like this. Yeah. I read the twits and I was like, I'm funnier than this. <laughs> I should write books. So yeah, that sounds stupid, but that's what I wanted to do. So you wanted to be an author. Based you, on the twits. Based on the twits. <laughs> You've ended up a long way away from, from writing books. You're in... Uh, I write in... emails. That kind of counts, yeah? And <laughs> yeah. write slides. That counts. <laughs> Um, yeah, you're in banking. Mm. Um, you've been in the industry for a long time. Mm. Uh, yeah, first of all, can you describe yeah like your day to day of your current role as um, yeah director of digital engagement? Yeah, so digital engagement is probably like two parts of the job. So one is like transforming what I would call distribution. So, so most people recognise that as like what you see in banking day to day. So like um, how we talk to customers. So you know, branches, call centers, mobile messaging, all of that, how we distribute products, services. Uh, so transforming that to bring it into the modern era, <laughs> tech, strategy, make us leading. And then the second part of that is I run um, what's traditionally known as like the chief digital office. Mm -hmm. So I basically run the digital channel. Wow. Yes, yeah, so that's like app, desktop, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's how the digital channel performs all the way from like service, customer satisfaction, to sales, to how we set up the strategy to win in market, because customers are demanding more and more from apps, yeah. more and more from their financial providers. Um, so yeah, it's doing all of that. Um, and most days, like I, I spend like thinking of big ideas, like yeah. how can I win? How can we do better? Make things better for customers. So a lot of big idea thinking, a lot of um, like data. I don't do the analyzing. I'm not the expert. <laughs> but I've got people who do that. Um, and a lot of leadership, like working through my team and stakeholder management, um, and I get to like explore tech, which I love doing. I love that. Um, in your in your current role, how mm. many people would you say sit under you? Yeah, so the current team is around like I think you know up to about four hundred people. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's new. Like that's six months ago, before it was like forty, like more senior people, small kind of transformation strategy team, We've gone up to four hundred. Um, like this is probably like a familiar number for me. Okay. So it's felt really good leading a big team again. Like I love the cultural stuff. I get, I love getting it right um, with, you know, big teams and influencing them. Um, but yeah, like I was thinking about it the other day. I remember managing like two, 3,000 people in operational roles. My goodness. Yeah, but they're all doing similar work in the operational roles, whereas this is more senior people, unique accountabilities, you know, so yeah. I'm enjoying it though. I'm loving going back to a big team. I love to hear that. So yeah. you've said there, you now manage 400. You've had a time in your life where you managed two to 3,000, which is mm -hmm. like absolutely mind boggling. Let's take it back. Mm -hmm. Like, can you walk us through some of, yeah, like the key moments in your career that have um, helped to get you to this point? And I suppose the first question is, you know, we spoke about you wanting to be an author. <laughs> like when did, um, 
when did banking <laughs> become become the career thought? Like, how early on did you know that's what you wanted to do? Like, did you study a degree knowing that's what you wanted to do? Mm. I mean, I know the answer to that, but yeah. yeah. Fun fact, right? Like, this is not what I wanted to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm here, but like, I, I didn't like sit there and go like, I want to work in a bank. And you know, where I grew up, nobody was working in a bank. Mm. Like, people were visiting the bank, but they weren't working there. <laughs> yeah. You know, my nan was like putting her gold in the safety deposit box, right? Like old Indian women things. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I never wanted to work in a bank. It was never the dream. I, um, you know, I worked in retail, uh, like through college and uni. I have got a degree in journalism and editorial design. Oh, wow. uh, like when I was like proper becoming an adult, I thought I'll go and do a uh, journalism degree and I would love to write about foreign policy. Okay. Right, like topical, especially at the moment. But I thought, oh yeah, you know, like that's what I'll go and do. I've always wanted to feel like I'm going to change the world. <laughs> I, yeah. I want to change things. I want to make an impact. Um, but yeah, so I ended up working part-time while I was at uni doing my degree uh, at uh, another bank, like in the call center. Um, worked part-time and weekends and then had a manager who was like, you know, you finished your degree, what do you want to do next? This was in Birmingham, right, where I'm from. And I said, well, why don't you send me to the press office in London and maybe I can work for, you know, like a bank press office. Mm. Uh, and she was like, why do you want to do that? You can work as a manager in the call center. And I was like, all right then. So I did the math on the numbers, right? And I was like, <laughs> I could get paid 15 grand living in London or I could get paid 21 grand living in Birmingham. I'm in the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm taking this job. And we needed it, right? We mm. needed it at home. I'm from a single parent family. Like I'm the eldest. It was going to help out with the bills. It would help. So I was like, 21 grand. Like, this is nuts. Mm. Fine, let's go. So yeah, I took that job and um, you know, I hate to say the rest is history, but it, like sometimes when I look back, it feels like yeah, I just work my ass off. Yeah. I work my ass off. I worked all the hours, I worked really hard. I worked in the operations, moved around. I got an opportunity to go out and live in the Philippines for a bit, put my hand up, did it. I got approached by another bank, moved, like worked there, moved to London for that bank, uh, then went to another bank did a couple of jobs there, went and worked in private equity and started exploring things that made me tick. So I wasn't doing operations when I left the first bank. I then started working in risk. Uh, and most people who know me like find that laughable, but like yeah. it's a job and I did it and I loved it. And I learned so much like conduct risk was topical. And then I was like, well, I'm going to go and try tech. And I really fell in love with tech. Mm. And then I just realized I like making change. I like taking something that's broken and complex and hard and making it brilliant yeah. in life and at work. And I get paid to do it and I love it. And that feeling you get when you've taken something that's broken and made it brilliant, like with a person or with tech or with a process, just like has become something I'm a little bit obsessed with. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and it makes me tick. Yeah. Um, so like I've, I've done that in multiple roles. And in my current role, you know, I always say there's three things I want to do in, in a job. The first is I love solving like complex problems. I get to do that every day. And I've been doing that for the last 10, 15 years maybe. I like the ability to lead large groups of people or influence them. So they don't have to work for me, but my sphere of influence is wide, stakeholders, teams, etc. I've been doing that for a very, very long time. And the last one is I like experimenting and playing with tech and I get to do that now. Yeah. So that's probably, I've, I've, and I've only learned that and realized that probably as a theme two years ago. Mm -hmm. But like, they're the things that make me tick and that's been consistent. So I've, I've moved banks like three times, four times. I've And, and on that, like mm -hmm. the moving of banks, has it, has it always been to progress? And what I mean by that, to take on like more seniority or sometimes has it been like a sideways move, but into like the unknown, like the risk role, just to um, expose yourself to like a, a new set of skills? So you know what, two things that are interesting. Um, I've, I've done a bunch of sideways moves, right? Um, and I think a lot of times and um, I think people think that I don't have like that experience because I've moved up quite quickly at a young age. Um, I look a lot younger than I am, by the way. It's, it's, yeah, it's Sinclair. But um, like I'm a lot older than I look. I moved sideways and I just did different disciplines. And what it meant is I became multidisciplined. Yeah. 
And so when the time came to get the promotions, they were easier to make the jump on. They were still hard, don't get me wrong, but I'd learned enough along the way. So I always felt more ready um, before I got the job because I was like, I'm getting there every time. But look, I did a head off job in one bank, very different to doing a head off job in a different bank. Mm-hmm. The size of the bank, the size of the job, the impact you have to make, the urgency, the responsibility, the accountability can feel very different. So the one thing I will say that I've learned in my career is um, like job titles are all relative. Everybody else who does my job in the UK is probably called a chief digital officer. I don't care, mm-hmm. job titles are relevant, like for me. Because I know a COO in one company, and I've done that job before, is smaller than a head of in another company. Yeah. So like job titles have been irrelevant, but yeah, to answer your question, sideways and promotion, and every time though, I've grown. You know, you mentioned the fact that you've progressed relatively quickly to get to where you are, mm. even though, I mean, you do look very young, but <laughs> <laughs> um, you're like, what do you think it is that has um, set you apart and allowed people to put so much faith in you to land these leadership roles. And yeah, how is it that, yeah, what is it that you've done to develop as a leader um, over the years? That's hard. (laughs) The girl from Birmingham wants to say to you like, I I don't know why these people had faith in me. Like that, you know, that's still like in here. Like Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna lie, like that hasn't gone away. To like a bit of imposter syndrome almost. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it's a little bit of like, you know, I, I still just like, I'm a girl from Birmingham, you know, like who didn't grow up with much and hasn't come from the corporate world. I've had no handouts. Nobody, you know, has been in a corporate world before me. All of those things. But the other part of me is like, I've worked hard. I've worked so hard. I'm tired. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I showed up, you know, every boss, I showed up. I was a person of value to my bosses. I was a person of value to the organization. So I think that's one. I think the second thing is I'm a bit fearless. Mm -hmm. I'm not really scared of much and I'm not scared of the unknown. And I think um, growing up where life threw a lot of stuff my way uh, at a very young age, you just learn to bat stuff away. Mm. And because I learned to bat stuff away, Like I never really go, oh my God, I can't deal with that. I never get overwhelmed because I'm scared of the unknown. I might get overwhelmed from being busy, but not because I don't know what to do here. It's like, okay, this is tough. I got this, I'll figure it out. Come hello high water, I'll figure it out. Because that's been life. So it's an innate thing in me that when I show up at work, I bring that with me because of what I've been through. Um, And then like, I'm confident, right? I'm not always confident, but I'm confident generally. Mm -hmm. I know who I am. I know what my values are. I know that I'm strong. Um, And I show up like that. And I think actually my authenticity, I don't hide who I am. I don't hide where I've come from. I don't talk different when I'm at work. I don't dress different. I'm always me. And I think that is something because that never falters in me i attract people to me who want to work with me and for me mm-hmm. and the ability to build teams and followership takes a lot and my, my superpower is probably that i'm really good at connecting dots and big ideas and yeah on that um point of building teams yeah like what is the approach you take to yeah building a team to work for you and help to connect those dots i like finding people who are better than me <laughs> right yeah. like I'm good at loads of things, but I'm, I'm not good at loads of things. Yeah. And so it starts with self-awareness. You gotta, like, you gotta know what you're not good at, but it really starts with knowing what you're on the hook for. So whenever I get a job, I'm like, what are my unique accountabilities? What is it that I need to deliver? And then what levers and skills do I need to deliver that? And then I find people who have those skills. I look for people who aren't the finished article, someone I can help grow and someone who's gonna make me a better leader. Mm. I'm working with a bunch of people at the moment and they're changing me and it's so good. I'm like, they're making me better and I love it. How, how is it they're making you better, would you say? So like a few of them are new like to, to me and like, you know, I've not worked with them before. Like one of them's like just so calm and he just gets so much stuff done, but he's so calm. 
And like, whenever I go with something that's quite complex and he'll be like, yeah, all right, so we could do this, we could do this. I'm probably trying to do an impression of him now. He's like, yeah, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. I'm like, all right, then you got it. And he's like, yeah, I got it. I'm like, okay, he's got it. And when he says he's got it, I know he's got it. And I'm like, worry gone. Me onto the next thing. The other one, she just got like a massive brain. Like she just, she thinks about things differently, you know. Um, and and th these guys are new to me. I'm managing them for the first time. Um, and they help me think differently. The, the, you know, the other two, like they've been working for different people for a long time. They're getting used to my leadership style. And so I'm learning how to adapt to be the best leader I can be for them. But I like to find people I can work with that want to be coached, that are coachable, um, that are better at things than me, like the hard skills. But they all have to be empathetic leaders. Mm. And the number one rule is, like, can I swear? Yeah. Don't be a dickhead. <laughs> That's my number one rule. Like, yeah. like you know, like just be a good person. Like, be a good person. That's the bare minimum. Yeah. Because actually, when I'm interviewing, I'm looking for a week and a tick. Are we gonna get on? We'd have to agree. Yeah. But like, have we got some common ground? And I've managed lots of people over the years. I've got no common ground. But you find common ground because yeah. you're people. Um. So yeah, like I look at that and I try and build diverse teams, people who think differently, you know, all the way from half of them have been to uni, half of them haven't, I like it. Yeah. I don't need one, you know, whether it's ethnicity, gender, religion, sexuality, neurodiversity, all of those things, it just builds for a better workforce. So yeah. When I see job um, adverts online, typically they say, you need five years experience, you need eight years experience, you need 10 years experience, even though, <laughs> but then like they want you to be this fresh faced person who's like super young, just at university. It's like the requirements for the roles don't seem to match up with um, the people who they actually uh, want to bring in in these mm. organizations. I suppose like, yeah, like my, my question to you is, do people need banking experience? Like, and if they do, how is it they get their foot in the door so they can look attractive to someone like you to work in your team? So look, um, I met a girl last week, right? Uh, and she's in banking now, like she's in my team. But she was telling me about her job before and she did e-commerce somewhere else, you know, like did a bunch of stuff. And I was like, can we talk? And she was like, yeah, I was like, me and you, we need a chat. I wanna know how everybody else did it. Bringing people into banking who just have experience in banking is not gonna change the way we do banking in the mm. UK. It is not. When I look at who I want to be, I'm not looking at trying to be the other banks. I'm looking at how Amazon using data. I'm looking at how is um, ASOS has got like a new, everyone laughs at me, like, cause I love ASOS. Like I'm a walking ad for it. <laughs> I think I'm wearing this ASOS. But like basically they've introduced like a whole AI generative assistant. The way they cross sell is nuts. Amazon cross sell better than any bank does. All of those things are really, really interesting. If we're looking for inspiration just in banking, that's poor. And if you hire people that have just come from banking, you're gonna get answers that always feel like banking. Mm. So for me, banking's good. It's not everything. Mm. I wanna go and find people who are breaking the rules, breaking the mold, who are doing things somewhere else, thinking big. And I wanna shake up what we're doing. But that's how I run my teams. Not everyone's gonna feel comfortable with that. So, you know, that that's how I think about it. But Look, you don't need lots of banking experience to get into banking. It just depends who's hiring you and who you're working for. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for like someone who's been an exec in a bank to come and work for me. I'm looking for someone who can help me solve hard things because they know how I'm gonna win. Mm -hmm. Th they get my shared vision. They've proven they can do it in another industry. By the way, I don't think job ads attract people like that. Therefore, I will, if I'm recruiting, I'll go on LinkedIn and I'll say what I need to in Taz language. Okay. But the best way now to get your foot in the door, apprenticeships are so good. Okay. And people just think like, it's uni, it's uni, it's uni. Culturally as well, right? Like Asian communities in particular, like get a degree, that used to be the thing. Oh, that was my parents as well. That's why I started this podcast actually. Really? <laughs> because yeah. like my parents were like, go to university. And my dad was like, become a doctor. And then when I said, I don't want to become a doctor. You guys too, yeah. Yeah, same. my dad was like, okay, become a politician. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, I know, I don't know what it is I want to do, but I just know it's not that. And I'm yeah. like, the sight of blood makes me faint. So yeah, like when I'd like had found an established career and I started thinking about like, oh, how can I give back? I'm like, there must be so many people mm. in my position who 
don't know what it is they want to do mm. but are capable and mm. it's like how do we expose you know careers industries pathways yeah. and yeah that's kind of yeah why we have the podcast now i love that <laughs> i love that and it's so crazy isn't it culturally because it's like this societal thing of go to uni and have a profession that looks like x y and z you know and i remember like growing up and it was like you know doctor dentist optician accountant uh, all of those things and I'm like why exactly like you can be whoever you want to be and I think what it has done in cultures like ours is limited and stifled creativity 100%. and people who who can be like big and bold I'm a massively creative person yes I work in the bank but I get to transform stuff every day so I just think you know uni is not always the answer apprenticeships are a good way to get your foot in the door the other thing is grad schemes are good like if you've been to uni and you're at the end of it and you don't know what you want to do. I sponsor the grad scheme, you know, where I work. Um, like I'm the exec sponsor for it. And like the diversity walking in through the door is brilliant. And I turn up then, I'm like, hey, I'm not a grad scheme kid. I turn up like this. I've got my air forces on, like I'm in there. And I'm telling them like, you can have as many careers as you want in banking. Mm. They've just come off the grad scheme, but we're investing in people like that. Every UK bank, big bank has got grad schemes. Um, apprenticeships, internships, all of those things. Like if you're at that age and that part of your career, do that. If you're not, and you like the look of a job, contact the person that's hiring. And if you look at the job and it sounds whack and it reads like a boring bank job, write to the person who's hiring for the job and tell them this is what your take is on it. Make connections, that's it. A hundred percent. But also just like, think about who you wanna work for. Because if that person is committed to finding someone in banking and you're not there, that's what they're going to go for. Yeah. That's not about you. That's about them. And yeah. the minute we start realizing that everything is about us, we start putting that pressure on ourselves. It's a I, big thing, yeah? I get that. There's, the, there's a couple of questions I wanted to ask. You, you mentioned apprenticeship versus grad scheme. Mm. My understanding of grad schemes, and it could be wrong, is that the people who are on grad schemes are almost fast-tracked to leadership versus like app apprentices etc in your experience can you like apprentice trajectory versus grad student trajectory you can get to the same place in the same amount of time i've got i've gone on none of those things yeah. and i'm where i am okay uh yes that has been true yes i know that to be true in many organizations i've worked in i've also seen a lot of people move from an apprentice uh, being an apprentice to then being placed on the grad scheme but not gone through uni mm. So we do that work, right? You go on the apprenticeship and then you go on to the grad scheme. You can be book smart, you can be a grad, you can be invested in by the organizations, but you could also not be any of those things and be an apprentice or not even be an apprentice and just work hard, be good at what you do, you know, have the right contacts, get the right sponsorship and fast track. I think sometimes people think if I go this way, I'll get an advantage and that's probably true in some cases, but it's not the only way. Mm. And like, I've not done any of those things. I had no reason to walk into banking. I started in the call center. On that, like, as I hear you talk and I'm, I'm, I'm loving everything you're saying, like there are, you know, tens of thousands of people who work um, at your company. Mm -hmm. There are gonna be the majority of them who never really progress. Mm -hmm. And then there are the special few who, you know, are part of your team and who make these leaps and bounds. What is it that you see in the special few that differs from the, the, the common many? You know the first thing? They want it. And it's not just they want it, they say they want it. They tell someone they want it. They show up like they want it. I talk to so many people. I want to progress. To do what? Don't know. Um, good. <laughs> that was me once upon a time. <laughs> yeah. Same. Yeah. But I never said I wanted to progress. I just wanted to do the next thing that made me tick. We're, yeah. we're all different. Or no one's progressing me. Sorry, what? Who's going to progress you? You've got to progress yourself. There are no handouts. Stop expecting it. The minute you stop expecting it and show up, like this life of yours is 100% your responsibility. Mm. Your career is 100% your responsibility. Like... The people that make it tell me they want to make it. But there are people who don't feel like they can make it. And I see something in them and I'm like, hey, why don't you want more? What do you mean? I'm like, but you're great. Do you know you're great? Mm. 
And so it's 100% your responsibility, but having someone that can spot talent in you, like... Goes a long way. Oh my God, you know, it's, I think about all the leaders I've had, they've worked me to the bone, but I am thankful and grateful for them every day. Um, I think the thing that sets them apart is like, once you know you want to, you want something, the ability then to learn and absorb information, take advice and find your way is really important. I've got a few people that I've worked with over the years and they're like sponges. Let's take it all in. They watch, they observe, they learn what to do. They learn not what, you know, what not to do. And they feel the fear and do it anyway. Mm. Um, everybody wants something. Uh, and it's okay not to be completely clear on what you want, but once you are, or once you want to show up like you want it, someone might help you get it. Yeah. You've got to be in the race to win. And and on that, like, you know, you've spoken about getting the right sponsor. As to anybody who's listening to this and they're thinking about oh, who is the right sponsor? Is it your manager? Is it someone else in an organization? How is it you go about finding the sponsor? It can be any of those things. Look, if your manager's not sponsoring you, get a new manager. Okay. There, I said it. <laughs> like, I've never worked for a boss that hasn't sponsored me. And if I think my boss isn't gonna sponsor me, I need to go find a new boss. Or we need to have that conversation. Maybe my boss isn't sponsoring me because they don't believe I can do it. Mm. And maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. Mm. And maybe I've got some shit I need to work on. Yeah. That's okay. But it's really important your manager sponsors you. I thrive when I've got a good boss. I love my boss. Like, I, you know, like I love working for him. The boss before that and the boss before that and the boss before that. They challenge me. But I thrive. When I, who I work for is so important to me. And that is like really, really important when you're showing up. Mm-hmm. Sponsors though in an organization are important. Sponsors outside of an organization are also important. Okay. I'm a sponsor for a lot of people that don't work for me anymore. They used to work for me, but I also know some brilliant talent out there that doesn't work for me. But when I see an opportunity, I put them on. Yeah. yeah? And what people do, and especially like women do this, uh, people of color do this, like minorities tend to do this because they can't see representation. They'll go and get a mentor. Everyone wants a mentoring chat all the time. And then I'm like, hey, what do you want to talk about? Well, I'm really feeling like I'm not progressing, blah, blah, blah. All, all factually correct but they use mentoring sessions for emotional conversations that's not wrong that's not wrong your mentor is there to help you day to day get through stuff i've got a coach she's half nigerian half norwegian i want to say yeah she'll kill me if i get it wrong (laughs) like I, i say that right it's important to me that i had a female i had a woman like a woman of color um like that was a bare minimum for me. And I told the organization that's who I wanted. We relate. I don't, I don't moan to her. I'm not allowed. <laughs> She'll be like, what, are you, what do you want? Where are you trying to get to? What are you trying to do? How can I help you? Um, she gives me practical stuff. So what happens when people go to mentors, they whinge, the mentor gives them some support. It's quite an emotional journey. In most cases, not every case. Your sponsor is there to get you the opportunities you deserve. And the good thing about sponsors is they want you to look good because it makes them look good. Mm. I sponsor people who are absolutely brilliant at what they do. I don't sponsor people who aren't not that good. If they're not that good, I'm like, go and get a mentor. (laughs) Not me, go get a mentor. I'll help. If you work for me, I'll coach you, you know? If you don't, like, let me get a mentor or get coaching on these three things. Let me help you figure out what you want. If I'm sponsoring you, I know you're good. I know you're going to perform. I know you're going to thrive. And when you get on, hey, I'm good at finding talent. Yeah. Everybody that sponsored my career, I made sure they look good. And mm. I made sure everybody that um, has sponsored me always gets thanked for the opportunities they gave me. Last night, I saw three of my old bosses, right? Three of them. And I'm still grateful to all three of them at different parts of my career. They sponsored me. They sponsored me because they believed in me, but whether they believed in me a lot or a little didn't matter. I made them look good when I got on. Mm. Now that I'm doing well, it looks good for them. Just like when my people are doing well now, it looks good for me. To um, the listener, and I think there's a couple of things here, like what is the advice to get um, 
productive mentorship. You're saying don't use it as an emotional session. Make sure you come with tactical or make sure you come with like tangible outcomes that you want to receive out of a session. So, so the difference on mentoring and sponsorship, like go to a mentor to get you through the day to day things. I say day to day, you know, week to week, month to month. Here's something I'm struggling with. I don't know how to approach this thing with this person in my team. Like I'm struggling with this with my manager. Seek out a sponsor when you know, where am I trying to go broadly? It doesn't have to be, I don't believe in having a job title or a job description. I'm trying to go here. The person that can get me there is either the person that works there already, or there's a person here who has connections as senior that can help me get there and they think I'm good or they know I'm good. Yep. That's how you seek out a sponsor. A mentor could be anybody who's just a little bit more senior than you who helps you through. A sponsor is a decision maker, is an influential person. They're either, you know where you want to go and they're there, or it's someone who's standing behind you, side by side with you, going, Taz, you want to get there? I know a guy. Mm. I'll open up the door. Sounds like you need the sponsor more than you need the mentor. <laughs> hey, I always, you know, like, you know, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, but a lot of the advice I give to people is like, who's sponsoring you? Not yeah. who's mentoring you. Yeah. I don't really care who your mentor is. Yeah. I don't know who's sponsoring you. And if, if nobody is and you're good, I'm sponsoring you. <laughs> but if Taz doesn't sponsor you, then you know you yeah, need to you, work on yourself. <laughs> yeah, you need to go get a mentor and get some feedback. I'm, I'm um, no, this, like, where I want to go next is you, you spoke about the fact that, yeah, your, your um, sponsor is, you know, Nigerian um, and Norwegian. My coach, yeah. Your, your yeah. coach, sorry, like, is a woman of colour. But yeah, representation mm. in the banking industry like you're a woman of colour who has gotten to this level, there are going to be people watching this like, how is it possible? Like when I was doing research for this episode, um, I saw that there's been an increase actually in like diversity in um, XX. I think it's gone from 22% up to 43% in the, in the last like six years. Mm. But when you look at women of colour in exec mm. roles, it was at like 4% and that might be outdated, but it was a very small number. So whilst there is diversity, like you are like the percent of the percent being a woman of colour um, in such a senior role, uh, how has it been? <laughs> and um, so yeah, to those people who are looking to you to say, hey, I see somebody who looks like me and I want to get there. Like what is your advice to people trying to navigate, um, yeah, like the difficulty? in getting to where you've got to look uh heavy is the head right like it is it's hard um the first thing is if anybody looks up and they see me i want them to know that if i did it like they can too mm. um it wasn't a lot of luck it's just like hard work but i had good sponsors i had good people behind me i moved away from things that didn't serve me i moved away when i'd outgrown my bosses i'd outgrown the job i know when to walk away and so knowing when to walk away when you're not being served is going to help you get to where you want to like fact do that and be really really clear about what you don't want it's not about being clear on what you want i don't know what i want to be when i grow up i don't mm -hmm. i know what i don't want though I know what I don't want to do. I, don't, I know what I don't want my life to be like. I know what I won't suffer. And once you're good on those things, find people who are going to cheer for you. Find your cheerleaders. And even when on the days that you feel like they won't cheer for you, you've got to cheer for yourself. Mm -hmm. Believing in yourself is a full-time job. Yeah. There are no days off anyone. Even on the days that you feel like having a day off, you can't. Because when you're a woman and you're a woman of color, there's enough stuff to battle with in the world. Mm -hmm. Enough. Why would you not show up for yourself? Show up for you and then find someone who's like me, who looks like me, who gets you, who gets your struggle and who's gonna hold their hand up and pull you up. And the thing that really pisses me off, and this is maybe controversial, but whatever, is people either women or women of color or men of color or anyone of color or you know whatever whatever that thing is that you've got when you don't feel like it's your job to pay it forward hmm. when you don't feel like you have a responsibility now don't get me wrong the burden is heavy every time i go to an event 
even if it's just like I went to my like my friend had a stag do right like we put on like a little stag do for him and it was meant to be like I was just with my friends everybody wanted to have a career chat with me that day mm. I need a day off <laughs> I don't mind I'm privileged to be in that position but find people who think it's their job to pay it forward because they they know what it's like to be you they've been there before and if they're going to give you a hand up that's good meritocracy though right I'm only going to give you a hand up if you're good. Hmm. And you only know if they're good, if they shout about it, so you know that if they're If they good. shout about it and they've got a proven track record, being good is the bare minimum. It's not everything and it's not enough. It's the bare minimum. Please do not come to me telling me you want to be X, Y, Z and get here when you are not performing in your day job. I cannot sponsor you. I cannot. Mm-hmm. I will not. You've got to show up and prove that you can do what it takes. Once you can do that, I've got you back. You know where you want to go? I'll help you. And in terms of that, like, um, being your own cheerleader, yeah, like, what is it that people can do? Is it documenting every time, like, okay, is it quarter-on-quarter performance? Is it year-on-year performance? Mm -hmm. Is it, like, intangibles as well? Like, connections throughout organisations? Like, yeah as people are listening to this like what is the tangible takeaway that they can take to yeah evangelize their greatness throughout their companies look there's there's loads of tangibles the first thing i will lead with though is normally if you're a woman you're from an uh, underrepresented community you're a minority especially if you're a minority right and like i think you'll get this we've grown up with those ingrained beliefs that you do not shout about who you are you do not boast you do not boast Humility, you know, is humility. So we're not used to going, hey, I'm good at this. I find it weird. Like, I don't go around going, I'm really good at this. But I have got more comfortable saying, I'm good at this thing. Not I'm good, I'm good at this thing. Because I was grown up, like brought up, sorry, to not be someone who shouts loudly about the things they've done. So it's something you have to unlearn, right? But what I do do is very factually talk about what I've achieved. So you should be able to articulate when you have done something good. And a really easy way to do that is think about a from and a to. I took the thing from this, and by doing these things, we went to this. Write it down in facts if you're uncomfortable boasting. Write that down. So from and to's are really good. That's the first thing. The second thing is have a self-advocacy folder, a brag folder, whatever you want to call it, right? Every time you get good feedback, you get a bit of good praise, you get a bit of good recognition, stick it in there. Even on the days when you don't believe in yourself, because remember, no days off, Mm -hmm. go look at that. Mm -hmm. Go look at that. It's like listening to your favorite song when you're having a down day, is that. Have that. Every quarter or half year or annually, I wouldn't suggest doing it just annually, go to your boss and tell them what you've achieved. Lock in on your goals, lock in on what they're looking for for you and tell them. I had my quarterly check-in yesterday morning. We talked about loads of stuff. We talked about what's next for the next quarter. Like, what are we going to do together? What are we going to smash through? Like, my boss is a big dreamer. I'm a big dreamer. We like to talk about what's next. We, We talked about what I've been able to achieve. We didn't spend ages on it. But do you know what I did before the meeting two days before? I said, hey, boss, on email, here's everything I set out to do in Q3. And here's how far I got. I didn't do it all. Here's how far I got. Here's what I've set in plan for Q4. Here's what I'm about to go do. And then we will interlock on, does he think my Q3 went like how I thought it did? And I said, look, what can I do differently? Any room for feedback? On the feedback you gave me last time, are you seeing a difference? We had an honest conversation, two-way feedback. Here's what I need a bit more from you. And then Q4, we set the stall out. So when it comes to the end of the year, I'm gonna be able to have another honest conversation. Too many people expect people to know what they're doing. Interlock on your goals. Tell them what you've done to achieve them. Get your brag folder out and be good at storytelling from and to. Okay. So I love that. So what I will say, working in tech, when I've interviewed at places in the past, you have your brag folder Mm -hmm. and you're ready, but then they always try and throw a spanner in the works like, talk me through... Um, a challenging time where you lost a client or Mm. you've had a negative situation and how you rebounded like what how do you take 
how do you tell a negative story to put yourself in a positive light? Because, I mean, I know you've had a successful career, but I'm sure there are going to be down moments, right? Loads. How is it that in those down moments, we're still pushing forward? You know, the first thing is own it. (laughs) Like so many people are like, I can't really think of a time. Yes, you can, you're lying. You know, find it, dig deep. I've got, I've got like one million to choose from. Yeah. It'll take me an hour to choose. So many things I've messed up. So many things I've got wrong. The first thing is describing like what it is that went wrong and why, honestly. And I think the only way you shine a positive light on these things is what did you do to get the, yourself out of that situation or get the organization out of that situation? Yep. And most people will talk about that really vaguely. So as an example, you know, I spilled a cup of tea. I went and cleaned it up. Story done. (laughs) I spilled a cup of tea because all of the things that were happening when I was making that cup of tea were this, 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 and this. You know, the things around me, the environment, what was going on? The tea spilled. After that, I reflected on why it spilled. Here's some ways I was showing up in that moment when I was making the cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Here's how I felt. I had two choices. Blah, 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 blah. And my, like, the one thing I would encourage everybody to take away from this is use proof points, please. Vague language is not gonna get you to win. Proof points. After spilling, like, after spilling the tea, this is how it felt. Once I cleaned it up, this is how it felt. This is where we got to. And in your like, situation of a client, I lost a client. Or I was about to lose a client, trust was here. Hmm. We took these steps, it was painful. Here's all the things I did. Here's all the ways that I felt uncomfortable. Here's all the ways I grew. Now, whilst that client's relationship isn't where I need it to be, what it has enabled me to do is grow X, Y, and Z with these other clients. 100%. Tell stories. Storytelling is so critical and we are so bad at it. Yeah, you know, and then I sorted it out. Like, all right. And on that, like, if someone is listening to this, like, I agree with you. I want to become a better storyteller. What can people do to tell better stories? Do you know what? This is hard. And like, I've had like so much help and coaching on this. Storytelling is about selling like a vision, a dream, like an end goal. You know, like when we were little, we we're like a beginning, middle and end. Honestly, just do that. Mm. Where did you start? What happened along the way? And what was the destination from and to? But describe the journey, use the proof points and bring it to life. And use your personality to do it. Mm. No monotone shit, no really. Talk about it. Talk about it authentically. Talk about it from your perspective. Not we all felt. Whilst everybody around me was feeling, for me, it felt. For me, I. Too many people are scared of saying I in interviews. We, we, we. Do you know how many times I've said, um, like, can you talk to me about when you individually did something? Because people are scared to say they did something themselves. You've got to show up like being about you. Mm. And so stories are just beginning, middle and end. Where did you start? What was the journey? Where did you get to? Weave some proof points in, numbers, feedback, whatever. Make people feel like they went on that change with you. It takes practice though. It does. God, I've practiced. Yeah. And I think like one of the things listening to you, it's like, yeah, you've had your sponsors you've had well yeah your sponsors more than mentors you've got your coach and you really put things into practice because I've had a lot of conversations and um yeah you can have your mentor but sometimes I think people just have them to have them mm. and they don't like have tangible takeaways but you know just listening to like your lived experience you, you're like a sponge <laughs> and it's like everything that like your whole career is like a sum of all of the inputs and the different experiences that you've had. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's great. I can see how you've gotten to where you've gotten to. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, before we go into like the, 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 the next part of this conversation, like, yeah, like to anybody who's looking for um, a career in banking or they're looking to take the next step and level up in banking, like what's their key, what's like your key piece of advice or key takeaway for them to action like right away? Yeah, if you're looking to move on, I would encourage you to think about how you become dynamic. Like a lot of people work in um, their lane. So, you know, if if you're a specialist, like you're an engineer and banking or whatever, right? Like that's fine. But if you wanna get into big leadership positions or you you wanna progress even in in a special niche, like think about being dynamic. So there's like, there's a few skills I think are really, really important, right? Storytelling is one. You're gonna be able to inspire people, bring people on the journey, 
show them the vision. You've got to be able to do that. So yes, you've got to know the vision, but you've got to get people to buy into it. The second thing I would say is leadership. That doesn't necessarily mean just managing direct reports. It's being able to lead people, take them with you, create followership. And leadership means care, it means empathy, it means coaching, it means decisiveness, it means um, saying no. Mm. It means saying yes to, but it means saying no to. All of those things, leadership is super important. And then the third thing I would say is like, when you've got a goal, being able to have like measures that people are held accountable to, that you hold yourself accountable to, to get there and be able to articulate that. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you wanna get on, you need to be dynamic. So storytelling is one way, leadership is another way. But if you're not performance driven and you don't create a performance culture, like you'll hit a ceiling because you're not gonna create tangible change as you go through. I'm a massively driven person, but I love being able to talk about what I've changed and how I've changed it. And measures, like that proof point thing is really, really important. So if, if those things like don't float your boat, like start practicing them or look for roles that bring that out in you. And for goodness sake, stop saying, oh, you know, um, lots of people say, oh, I'm a master of all trades, like, or, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, or I'm a generalist. I hate that. Mm. Anybody who works for me, I tell them, you do not call yourself that. You are multidisciplined. I ain't generalist of anything. <laughs> Nothing is general about me or what I've done. Yeah. I'm multidisciplined and that has been an intentional choice. So make intentional choices, but also feel free to walk away from something that's not serving you now to get you to where you wanna to get to. Be that your boss, your job, the experience. Go and seek out things that you think will make you better. And in particular, seek out the things that you're bad at, that you think you need. Go and get a job where you're gonna to have to do more of it and it makes you uncomfortable. Mm. Me doing risk was like, mm, was like yeah. Googling stuff. I was like, what is this? But sometimes that's what it takes, right? And I God, think like yeah. there's all like in any role that people do, there's a period of time where you don't really know what you're doing. It's just about like how much you're willing to apply yourself. And so. you know, some people hate me for saying this, but yeah, I think maybe we're in a society where people have a bit of an entitled mindset. Like um, I've seen it you know in you know different organizations where people work in a place for a year two years and they're like i must get a promotion um yeah like i must move on to the next thing a year goes by i must move on to the next thing it doesn't work like that um yeah you have to you have to earn it to your point and i think even listening to what you said is yeah like you need to have some indication on where you want to go because if you're just like i get a promotion promotion to what <laughs> like what if what what if you don't want to what if you don't want to do the, the the role above so do you know how many people say to me i want to be a grade this or i want to be a manager I'm like, of what mm. like are you chasing a title a pay rise a promotion if you are cool say it but i'm not going to give it to you based on that mm. i need to know you're going to be able to make an impact and so I, I think there's a lot of that. And I see more and more that people think that there's a timeline to things. So I come across a lot of people who's like, and you know, I, God, I used to be like this when I was young, right? Like for about a year. And then I realized life doesn't work like that. Like at this age, I'll be here. And then mm. I'll buy a house by this age. I'll be married by this age. I'll do this by this age. None of that happened. Mm. None of that happened to me. It happened at the time that it was meant to happen. And so when people don't achieve those milestones that they've set for themselves, they become disgruntled. And then that shows up in energy at work and it shows up in the way they behave. And guess what? They find other people who feel the same. Misery loves company. And now we've got a group of disgruntled people who are really unhappy about their lives and can't move out of that. Mm. Like, have a plan. But just know that life doesn't always go to plan. And that's okay. That's okay. Sometimes I've stayed in a job a year longer than I expected to. I never go into a job and say, I'm going to do it for three years. I'll know. I'll know when it's time. And something that has come to me, like just going back to like the, the sponsorship point, like how important is like networking both internally and externally? And what I mean by that is, yeah, like if you're not going to, like if you're in banking, if you like, do you need to go to extracurricular events? Do you need to go to yeah this work thing, that work thing, or can you just like do the job 
and still progress like how important is it doing the extras look a few things like i hate networking uh, it makes me uncomfortable i um i've got adhd i get very overstimulated um, i also have like massive social anxiety which people never believe because i'm such a bubbly person but i'm like oh my god lots of new people it's going to be overwhelming um so for me networking is like really overwhelming doesn't mean i don't do it I see lots of people go to every networking event there is. Like they'd go to the opening of an envelope. And I'm like, what are you going there? Like, what are you going to do? Do you know what I mean? Like, why are you there? So networking is good. And I'd say like in your career, when you go to events that are related to the work you do or not, if you know what you want to get out of here, go to the thing, go to the thing, but don't just go to things. Like remember being good is the bare minimum. So many people that go to event after event and they're not delivering. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people, especially a lot of young people who are on the come up, they're like, I'm at networking events. And like, what? Like, does your manager think you're sick at your job or what? Because mm -hmm. if they don't, like, who are you going to talk to? Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying don't do one or the other, but do both. But what I think is more important than networking, and networking is about events, is nurturing and building relationships. The amount of relationships I've built over my career that I nurture and maintain, and some not, you know, uh, is important. And I pride myself on being someone that is easy to work with. I'm hard to work for. I know that I'm requiring, like my standards are high. I ask for a lot. I also give back a lot. But my peers and, you know, people that I work around will say like, I'm easy to work with. I don't pop a lot of barriers. I'll get stuff done. I'll pick up the phone. So maintaining, nurturing those relationships is what gets you on. Because the next time someone wants to give someone a job, actually, yeah, not only is she good, she's actually really nice to work with. Mm -hmm or she's good crack, or she's got a lot of energy, or all of those things. And people know that about you based on how you show up. So a lot of people think networking and going to events will get you on. It will open your eyes to lots of things, but the relationships that you've got, you don't know where they're gonna play out. Every one of my ex-bosses I saw yesterday works somewhere else now. Yeah. They're sponsors. Should I leave? I might be able to call them. They might not have a job. They might know someone else who can hook me up. Nurture relationships. Be a person of value, not a person of success. So many people just want to be successful. But actually, you've got to add value to the relationships, to your work, to everything else. So whilst I think networking is important and I do it, I'm probably like at, at a place now where I don't do it as much as I used to when I was younger. And I don't have to do a lot of cold like, hey, I'm Taz. Whereas a lot of people come and, you know, try and sell me stuff or whatever. Um, I pay more attention to the relationships I've got. And you, you, you spoke about nurturing them. How, like, what is it? Is it coffee? Is it you send an email? Like, how is it you, like, I know how I nurture relationships, but yeah, just to yeah, listen up. Like, loads of different ways, right? So sometimes it's a coffee and all of those things. Sometimes it's an email, but sometimes it's just like, uh, if I see them, hey, I was thinking of you. Someone mm. messaged me the other day, right? And was like, hey, I was wondering if I could ask you a favor, like, you know, someone new starting in my team, can you take them out for a coffee? It's like, yeah, sure. And then I was like, hey, how are you? Like, by, like, sure, I'll do that, but how are you? I haven't spoken to you in ages. Like, everything good? Like, yeah, we're good. All right, cool. I saw someone the other day, I'm like, how's family, man? Like, we didn't even need to talk about work. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, family's good, blah, blah, blah. And you know on that, I think something which is like really good for nurture, um, nurturing relationships, one of the things is what you did there, it's like, doing things and not expecting anything in return. It's almost like the pay it forward that you were saying. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing which I find with like some of my friends from like university and stuff, it's the ability to, to pick up after months, weeks, Nothing. weeks, months, years, and it's like no time has passed. Mm. And there's like, no, oh, he didn't speak to me, so mm -mm -mm. I now have a problem. It's like, no, you just understand that we have lives it's and fun. life gets in the way and that's okay yeah. but like being present in that moment to yeah take the time to catch up to reminisce and then go forward and in a work context it's so much easier because nobody's expecting you to be on all the time mm. say hi in the lift i'm in london that day do you want to catch up i'm so and so blah 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 see someone on the train i always stop and have a wave if i see them i know it sounds really small but actually maintaining relationships or just letting someone know you're about or knowing that they can call on you and you also calling on them is how you build up like that stakeholder network. Yeah. I network less, but I really, really dial down on my relationships. Yeah, and I think um, just to round out the point, I think it's easier to build these relationships when you radiate positive energy. Spot. Like if 
you are gloomy, like you said, if you appear stressed, erratic, you mm-hmm. snap at people, people don't want to open up to you. But if you come at people with warmth, with like um, a positivity, mm-hmm. and people know that, yeah, they're going to get like a positive outcome, it draws people towards you. And I think sometimes people, Agreed. like, they don't understand like how body language puts people off. And like, oh, why, mm-hmm. why is it people treat me like this? Mm-hmm. What is this? Do you yeah, get what I mean? Like, it's like, what is that? you always have to be on almost Mm. and you always just have to be cognizant of your surroundings because like it's like unconscious bias i suppose people pick up on these things um but yeah Yeah. i just wanted to say that but um this has been like you know you've spoken about all the advice that you've given and that leads us like nicely into office real talk Mm. um so yeah on top of being like a director at a bank yeah you 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 set up um uh, yeah this page i mean i'll let you introduce it there like what was the origins of 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 office real talk and yeah can you yeah explain what it is you're doing with it yeah i mean um look i've been talking to people and helping people in their careers like since i started out and and i love it and it feels rewarding. And I really care about like getting more people to win. Um, and as a kid that came from, you know, I'm from a single parent family, like grew up on free school meals. I'm from like the arse end of Birmingham. Um, sorry to anybody who's from <laughs> Aston is not it. Uh, I love it, it's home, but you know, it was, it's, it's like, you know, socially quite deprived and stuff like that. But like, I'm from there. Um, and making it to where I am now has been hard. And I just sit there so many times in situations and I'm like doing them and I'm like, how the hell did I learn to do this? And I realized a while ago, no one taught me. No one taught me, there was no playbook. Mm -hmm. No one taught me how to chair a meeting. I didn't really learn how to properly do a good slide deck. No one taught me how to do income or like budgeting or benefits cases or like working with tech. No one taught me any of those things and they're hard skills. Mm. No one also taught me how to be a leader. I watched leaders, but no one said, here's what you do. Nobody told me how to navigate my career, navigate those difficult conversations in the corporate world, blah, 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 blah. And so uh, a lot a lot of my friends were always like, oh, Taz, you know, like it's sick when you help us or it's really good, whatever. Uh, like when I met my husband, um, like we'd been together a while. He was just saying to me, he was like, I know like you're doing really good at work and stuff, but he just said, I just, I just always thought that you would do something else. Mm. I was like, what do you mean? Like we have a good life. <laughs> we want me to do something else. And he was <laughs> like, no, like you just help so many people and you care about it and you inspire so many people. And I just have always pictured you doing that. And I was like, well, what does that look like? And he was like, I don't know. And I was like, okay, and I kind of ignored it. But anyway, I took a career break for a while, for three months. I walked away from a job without having another job to go to. Took some time out. And I remember it was a Tuesday morning and I was sitting there and I text my friend. Um, so she, and she works with a, a young people's um, charity and they help like people from, you know, minority ethnic backgrounds and underprivileged backgrounds like get into the corporate world. And I said to her, I said, I'm gonna start a page. And she's like, what, what page, what are you on about? I was like, I'm gonna start this page on Instagram. And I'm just gonna give out free advice. I was like, all right. And she was like, do it, bro, do it, bro. Like, you know, she's from Wolverhampton, right? Like we say bro every two words. <laughs> so she was like, do it, bro. And I was like, yeah, I was pumped. And I was like, I don't know how to start an Instagram page. Anyway, I had this time off and I started this Instagram page. Um, and the whole point behind it, I, it was at the time called Out of Office Real Talk and now it's Office Real Talk. Um, but it's somewhere where I can authentically talk to people about what it is like to work in the corporate world. And I don't mean emotional therapy and all of that. There's a little bit of like relatability because we have unique experiences, but it's about how to get on. And it's about practical tips. It's about career advice because I want more people to win. Mm -hmm. I want more people like me to win. And I want to be the adult I didn't have when I was younger in the corporate world. I love it. And on that, I'm actually going to draw from my phone because I've I've got a few excerpts from the page, oh, and no, I want to say <laughs> I want to <laughs> I want to talk about them uh, in a little bit uh, more detail. So um, yeah, the first one is um, yeah, you've spoken about 
five key reasons mm. why people are overlooked for promotions. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. Why is it you feel people are getting overlooked for promotions? So I'm really putting you on the spot. Right. <laughs> you, you tell me if I get them wrong, yeah? But I, but I think, like, look, there's a few things. I think the first one is... Um, like, you're doing the work, but people don't know you're doing it. Yeah. So that's one thing, right? Like they can't attribute that work to you. The second thing is your work's good. People think you're a good performer, but your brand is not promotion worthy. Mm. Your personal brand is not promotion worthy. So when people say, oh, great individual contributor, very, very talented, not empathetic, not a good leader, therefore not going to get promoted. Right, is that? So that's the second thing. Your personal brand is not promotion worthy or, or you know, kind of is going to get you to be successful. Um, the third one is nobody knows that you want to get on. <laughs> you know, you've been saying it in your head. You're really upset you've not get on. Have you put yourself forward for any opportunities? I remember once a job came up and I said to someone who was a sponsor for me at the time, like they called me, they're like, Taz, those two jobs have gone up. Are you going to go for them? I was like, I don't want none of those jobs. And it's like, are you going to go for them? I was like, but I don't want them. Like, but if a job came up like it, do you want it? And I was like, yeah. So if you don't put yourself forward now when these two jobs are up, when the next one comes up, they're not even going to reach out to you, Taz. And I was like, but? And they were like, no, because even if you don't want these, if you get it, what's the worst that's going to happen? And if you don't get it, A, they know you want it, you've signaled. B, you've gone through the interview process, so you're ready. These mm -hmm. jobs don't come up very often. And I was like, oh my God. So it's that. People don't know that you're in the race. You want to be in it. People don't know that you want that. So that's the third thing, right? Um... I think the fourth thing is your manager isn't sponsoring you. Mm -hmm. If the person that you work for, the person that is closest to you, the person that's meant to have your back, is not sponsoring you, you gotta get to the bottom of that. Like I said, get a new manager or figure out why. They might be right, they might be wrong, whatever. You gotta get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is a hard one, right? But I think sometimes it's a realization that the thing you want or the opportunity that you want is not gonna happen where you are, whether that's in your team, in your company, in your sector. And that could be for various reasons. It could be because they can't recruit anymore. They don't have the budget. It could be because everybody in the role above you is never going to leave. They're going to die there. Like that's happened before. It could be that the thing you want to do doesn't exist in the company you're in. You're not a tree. Move. <laughs> move. <laughs> like we can all move. Just move. Yeah. So yeah, like th those things are really important. But people don't think about those things. They just think it's not happening because it's me. Yeah. And my favorite thing that happens is people from backgrounds like ours, like mine, say it's because they're not given, you know, uh, like diverse talent opportunity. That might be true. It very well might be that. You can change that? Probably not. And the minute you realize that you can't change that, you, you got, move. You gotta find somewhere that will. My coach said it to me. She was like, Taz, when are you gonna realize you cannot single-handedly change diversity in an organization you can't and i was like but, 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 but why and she was like are you kidding me right now mm -hmm. she's like you're a smart person i'm sitting there going yeah i can't but i can change what i do in my team i can change who i surround myself with i can look to the peers that look like me that are like me and find things in common and we can talk about it and that's what i did I'm trying to change the entire company but i'll put more people on i'll bring them up um so yeah i think like we, we tend to always look outwards. And one of the things when I started the page is I talked about everyone's so busy talking about how companies are showing up. But we also need to show up differently. And, and you can only control the things you do. Yeah. Life becomes a lot easier when you realize you can't control everything around you. You can control you and the choices you make. And once you know that, you are in charge of your career and you will stay nowhere that doesn't serve you. I love it. I love it. Um, there's there's one more. Well, there's two more, but I remember the third one. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> You've actually it? kind of just... <laughs> so, you, yeah, you said um, the number one thing stopping people from being successful is imposter syndrome. Mm. Like, how, to the listener, can they help to combat their imposter syndrome? Unpopular opinion from Taz. <laughs> I hate imposter syndrome and I don't buy it. Don't get me wrong. If you think you got it, you probably do. Like I have a flavor of it. We have got so obsessed as a society, especially like women, minorities, like we're just walking around talking about imposter syndrome. Like, oh, you got it too. Yeah, I got it too. Like, I got, 
talking about like it's a cake. Like what? Every- <laughs> talking about it like it's COVID. Do you know what it is? Like, you got it. You got it. Are oh, you tested positive? Yeah, me too. yeah. It's true. You know what? It's true. That. Like, I should write that down. But like everyone's talking about it like that, and do you know what? Like it's not helpful and it's not healthy and it is holding us back as a people and a society and a generation and a culture because we're just all going, we've all got it. Hey, let's take the COVID thing. When you had it and I had it, we had it differently. Mm-hmm. You couldn't taste, I couldn't smell. You couldn't get out of bed, I was fine. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Imposter syndrome we've is become a thing and it's become really topical. And I just think if I was going to give everybody one piece of advice, if you think you suffer from it, peel the onion, man. Like imposter syndrome, peel it all the way back. What is it that I am feeling? When does it show up? Who am I with when it shows up? Where am I when it shows up? Because then you've got stuff you can action. When you're just walking around talking about imposter syndrome, reading books on it, watching podcasts, watching YouTube videos, you're not unpacking it and you're not, to your point earlier, there are no tangibles. Mm -hmm. So my imposter syndrome shows up when I go to a meeting to discuss a topic that I don't feel confident on, that isn't in my normal skill set, right? So it's not like the thing that I'm the most passionate about that I get. And I haven't prepared, so I don't have, I haven't done any reading, I've just turned up, and everybody around me in that meeting knows way more than me, but I've got to turn up and participate. I don't know the topic well, it's not my normal topic to go to, I've done no prep. And I know everyone in the room is gonna be smarter than me on that thing. I feel like an imposter. That's when it shows up consistently. It shows up in other spaces too, but I would say 90% of the time it's that. Mm-hmm. So now I know when I go to meetings like that, A, I say to my PA, I need time before that meeting. That's my prep time. <sighs> Get in my head. I like to read my information, but I normally do a bit of prep. I'll talk to someone in my team who really knows it, or I'll say, will you come to a meeting with me? Like that kind of stuff. And I'm combating it. My imposter syndrome used to turn up when I used to do public speaking, and I do loads more of it now. But you know how I'm combating it? It's because I wasn't feeling confident. I felt like people wouldn't listen to me. I felt like I wasn't a good storyteller. So I do so much of it now, like I practice and I practice, and I'm feeling more and more confident. It's not gonna go away until you pinpoint what it is. And then face it. And then work on it. It's like therapy for free from Taz. <laughs> blind leading the blind out. Here, guys. <laughs> um, the, 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 the next thing which I've seen on your page and I've spoken about on this podcast, but yeah, I really want to get um, your view on is like interviews, right? Mm. So being a leader of, you know, hundreds and thousands of people, you must have been in so many, in, interviewed so many people, obviously going for leadership roles. You've obviously also mm. been in interviews. Like what, are the key things to help somebody stand out in an interview we'll we'll start there the first thing i'd say is don't treat an interview like you're being interviewed only you're also interviewing the person you're figuring out if that's who you want to work for if that's the job you want to do if that's where you want to show up the minute you walk in thinking like that the balance of power changes this is a mutual conversation yes i want the job but i could get it and be super unhappy So I'm trying to figure out if I want to work for you too. So now I'm sitting up different. Now I'm taking up space differently. That's the first thing. But I think most important thing that I fall in love with when I'm in an interview and the question I'm always looking to answer in my head is can I work with you? So I'm looking for someone who's authentic. I'm looking for your personality. You can do all of the situation, task, action, review, like all of that stuff, right? Like result, blah, blah, blah. I'm looking for you. Why you? 20 people could give me the answer that's as good as that. But when I've picked people, I'm like, do they have that thing that I'm missing in my team? Do they have the charisma? Do they have the personality? And a lot of people turn up to interviews like robots. Mm. You can't help be nervous, I get it. You can't help but sweat, I get it. Just turn up and bring all of you to that interview. So important. Because you know what? You're one of one. Mm. And the thing that's going to make you shine through is your personality. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is people always try and predict what questions they're going to get asked. I think they'll ask me this. I think they'll ask me this. I think they'll ask me this. And they rehearse the answer. Yeah. I don't do that. And I don't encourage other people to do that. I think about, and it goes back to the first question you asked me, like what are those career defining moments? Good and bad. 
You know, we talked about the things where you've had the losses, like when you've taken the L's, like the good and the bad. Write down those career defining moments because who knows them better than you? No one, not the interviewer. They weren't there, you were. And turn them into stories from and to proof points what happened. And when you know all of that, you're just talking about your experience. You're not trying to answer the question in a way that you think you need to. Because yeah. I don't need to know the question, I know the answer. So they're gonna ask me like, tell me about a time when something went good. Well, I've got a bank of six situations in my head, I'll pull one. When did you learn something? Actually, I've got three scenarios. I'll pick the one that blah, blah, blah. You can say that out loud, I do. What that does is helps you turn up more authentically. Most people think I need to give this answer mm -hmm. and that's what gets in the way. And then I think the last thing is the questions you ask are so important. People don't focus on that. They're normally like, oh, when do I find out? <laughs> like, oh, come on, you can do better. I love questions like, when was the last time someone got promoted in your team? What actions are you guys taking to make yourself uh, a diverse employer? Can you talk to me about the diversity statistics in the organization and more specifically in your team? They're just some examples, right? But so just on that, I would feel like if they didn't know the answer, I'm like offending them and putting them on the spot. So? You want to work for someone who doesn't know the answer to that? Make a choice. You might do. Facts. So? Facts. Why am I interviewing you if I'm not prepared to be asked questions? Mm. And if you don't know, be humble. I feel like Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, but, but, but do you know what I mean? Like, just be like, do you know what? I don't know that. I think it's between two and 5%. I can get back to you specifically, but it is, and they, they should be working hard to make you feel good that they care about that. And I've just given some examples of diversity. You can ask loads of the questions. Yeah. I love it. And, you know, we've spoken about some things that people can do to set themselves apart. What are the red flags? So what are the things that people should be steering clear of in interviews? And yeah, what is it that typically happens in an interview where you know that that candidate isn't right to work for your organisation? Do you know what? It's been a really long time since I've had a bad interview and it's because I'm really picky at shortlisting. Okay. I'm so picky. Like, the CV has to be amazing. I do the LinkedIn stalking. I might Google stalk you, all of that, right? Um, so I'm really good at shortlisting. Like I like meticulously shortlist. Um, but I think red flags would be like, I think like if you can't maintain eye contact, your body language, all of that, how you're showing up, like I'm just like, you don't look interested. The second thing is like, if you don't have any passion in how you're answering and you don't look like you want it from like, from the questions you ask me to the way you're engaging with me, like that would be a massive red flag. And I think less, like it's not that important how you answer the question because yes, that matters, but we all know we get nervous in interviews. We all know that, you know, like stuff happens. I think the main thing is like talking about something like you want it. So it's like, blah, 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 blah. And I've done this before. And I love it when people say, and that's why when I saw this role, I was really excited because it's an opportunity to build on that experience I've already got. Mm -hmm. People who can't do that and relate back to why they want the job. Like for me, I'd just be like, why you? Every time I'm sitting in an interview, I'm going, why you? That's what's going through my head. So I, I just think like, it's, it's that whole thing of like how you show up, showing up like you want it, acting like you care. Like they're all the things I care about whether you answer the question, I do. But that might not be the reason that I pick you over someone else. And like, what's your what's your views on like being well researched? I know it might sound like a silly question. But I, I care, I care. Um, it's not everything though. There was a lady that I interviewed about like three years ago and she was so impressive. Like she'd researched all the banks like value, some of the corporate sustainability numbers, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you're good. But she used it in a way to ask me a really hard question at the end of the interview. And I just went, ooh, I was not expecting that. And she smiled and she went, I'm really sorry. And I was like, why are you sorry? Mm. That's a good thing for you, bad for me. And I said to her, I said, you know what? I don't think I can answer your question. I'm gonna give you a half-assed answer. But I said, what I am gonna do is I'm gonna email you after this. I'm gonna find that out for you. 
she absolute her answers throughout the interview were not good. But that, I was like, she's got something about her. She just doesn't interview well. And I had a follow up with her. So like the takeaway I get from that, because yeah, that was going to be like one of my things. Like, like you said, there are nerves. A lot of times when people are interviewing, like they want a job so badly or like they're not able, you don't really know the person, mm -hmm. right? But just being able to show a little bit of your uniqueness, yeah. it might help to overcome what necessarily wasn't a great interview. That's really good to know. Because sometimes like, it, and me in the past, like y you're at the end of an interview, you're just like, uh, no. you, you almost like give up, yeah, you're like yeah. resigned. But it sounds like they're like, you can make it up. Don't give up. Never. You can always show yourself if you're the right person for the role mm. at any point in the interview. 100%. 100%. And do you know what? Like, if you're an interviewer or you're a leader of people, your job is not to catch someone out. Mm. Your job is to make them comfortable so they can showcase the best of themselves. So you know what I do at the start of an interview? I'm like, hi, I'm Taz. Like, really good to meet you. Um, just before we get going, I'm just going to say, like, I've read your CV. I liked it. That's why we're here. Look, I'm hoping that this is going to be a really good hour for us to have a chat. I want to get to know you more, your experiences. You'll have the opportunity to ask me some stuff. Let's take this at your pace. Let's get comfortable. You know, I'm here so I can learn the best things about you. As an interview, you can really calm someone down. Mm. My job is not to catch you out. I love it. Um, as we're talking about interviews as well, like you're in a, like, a very senior role. I think another thing people struggle with is... Um, getting the value that they're worth mm -hmm. so yeah in your career mm. like how is it you've seen people go about asking for pay rises and yeah to people who are like feeling undervalued what would your advice be to them firstly ask don't not ask and then be upset later <laughs> you get one chance at asking when you're getting the job um look only you know what number's good enough. The advice I'd give is always don't downplay that number. Go with the number you want. Because there's only one thing that they're going to offer you. They're not going to normally offer you more than you ask for and offer you less, mm -hmm. right? So ask for the number that you want. And there's lots of ways to do that, saying thank you for your offer. I really appreciate it. Based on my expectations and previous salary, blah, 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 I would expect this. You don't have to give any numbers. You just say, this is what I'd expect. You don't even have to justify why. I helped my friend recently where he had to pay for all the travel. And I was like, just say, based on the travel and what it would cost, I would expect the salary to be this to cover that. Ask is the first thing. And if you're not comfortable asking face to face, because a lot of people aren't. No. Just, <laughs> just ask on email. Um, I've done it before where I've said, I really appreciate the offer. I'm really grateful. Um, based on the fact that I am... Uh, ethnic minority woman I'm impacted by both the gender and the ethnicity pay gap can you please confirm to me that this offer will put me on par with people from a different gender and from a from a white ethnicity um yeah and I asked them to confirm that and, and I didn't need to see their benchmarking exercise but I needed them to confirm in writing that they had done that and they did and they put my salary up as a result of it. Oh, wow. Because I'm not about to get underpaid for being a woman and being brown. Sorry. I know what I bring to the table. And and on that, like, would that make you think about the employer? Or because they were able to do that? Like, does it then make you think, oh, well, they was ready to, like, shortchange me because I'm a woman of colour? Or no? Um, I'm, I'm, we're getting too deep into no, it. No, no. You know what? It's in, no, it's interesting. Because I don't know if it's about the employer. T take away the fact that I'm me. A white man could just get paid whatever they offer. It, w it wasn't about that. Okay. It's the fact that I asked. In my budget, so I'm not always just going to offer you loads and loads of money. I've got to run a budget. Mm -hmm. But because I'm a brown woman, I will look at, okay, this person, they're probably like, let's just check them against all their white peers. Or like with females, I'll be like, let's check them against their male peers. Not everybody's doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky in the organization I work for. I'm lucky that I do that. I'm not lucky, actually. I learn how to do that because of where I'm come from. But it doesn't make me think about the organization. It just makes me think, actually, I asked and they said yes. And even if they said no, I would have said, okay, 
they can't show other people's salaries. Can you show me where I benchmark in what quartile percentile? They might do that. Okay. And then you've got a decision to make. Yeah. Either way, I was going to get paid good. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not about not to get what I deserve. Yeah. I love it. Because believing in yourself is a full-time job. No days off, right? That's, that's, that's one of my biggest takeaways from this conversation. No days off. Taz, before we get into um, the quick fire round, like as... Um, you know, to any listener who's gotten to this point in the conversation, like what's something that you want them to take away from from this conversation? I'll, I'll say two things, right? The first thing I'll say is just get out of your own way. Just get out of your own way. Like we are in our own way all the time. And that's because you're in here. Get out of your own head, get out of your own way. That's the first thing. The second thing I'd say, and I thought about this the other day when I was talking to my team, even when you're scared, do it anyway. Do it scared. Because work is the only place in our lives where we get to be scared and say no because of it. Mm. Life does not afford you that chance. Facts. Life does not afford you that chance. And I was thinking about it the other day. In my life, I've been scared and I've had to show up. And I had a choice. Life threw it at me and I had to show up. No matter how old I was, no matter where I was, no matter what happened. I had to show up for me, for my family, for anything. When I'm at work, I get to say no and sit confident. Oh, I'm not going to put myself forward for that. I won't do that presentation. Why? Life's scarier than work. Mm -hmm. Life is so much scarier and so much harder. And if you mess up at work, you mess up for the day, the task. I don't normally get sacked for one mess up. Unless you're stealing money or you're breaking something, like you're not. Mm. In life, when you're scared and you get it wrong, things go badly wrong sometimes. Do it scared because life doesn't afford you the chance to not do that. And you got through 100% of those days, man. So work's just work. Taz, what a, what a conversation this has been. We do have a quick fire round. Ah, I'm here for it. You ready? You ready? Back to the phone, I'll go. Yes. Unlimited budget with strict deadlines or limited budget with flexible timelines? Unlimited budget, strict le- deadlines <laughs> every day. Um, lead a small innovative team or manage a large established department? Lead the small innovative team. Love it. Money or happiness? Both. <laughs> Manapiness is what we've said. <laughs> oh, I like that, yeah. I don't think you can be happy without money. Yes, yeah, facts, facts. I think sometimes you just need to be honest about it though. And I think like definitely to uh, an extent, like money affords you a lot of happiness money buys freedom freedom makes me happy yeah (laughs) um personally interact with a hundred customers daily or analyze data from one million user interactions (laughs) that's so hard um i do the first and get my team to do the second okay (laughs) (laughs) very diplomatic (laughs) Um, focus on attracting new customers or retaining existing ones retain and deepen existing love it um work from home or work from the office that's hard, you know. I get my energy from people to work from the office as long as I can work from home sometimes. It's a hybrid. <laughs> yeah. I, I, need, I need my comfy pyjamas. <laughs> um, would you rather travel to the past or future? The past. Favourite quote? Oh, do you know what? I don't know if I've got a favourite quote, but I said something um, to my team the other day that I'm like going with now. Yeah. And talent wins games. That's it. Teamwork wins championships Ooh. Mm. so I brought like my two old teams together for the first time on Tuesday and I called the whole day like unlocking value as one team and I just said that I then followed up with a Drake and Jay-Z song <laughs> nobody knew and I was like okay it's cool but yeah it, you know that I love because for me like you you can't do anything alone I love it talent wins games talent wins games teamwork wins championships love it um, and then final thing, yeah, like dream dinner guest. Oh, this is so, so, so hard. Um, on a personal one, my dad. Oh, okay. Yeah, my dad. Has, um, yeah, this has been yeah, such a such a wonderful, uh, insightful conversation. We do have a closing tradition. Okay. Like with every experience you've been through and knowing what you know now, um, what advice would you give your younger self and would you still be doing the same thing? Um, the advice I'd give to my younger self don't care what they think you're never a lot just do it like yeah 
just I've always thought I'm a lot. I'm just me. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Um, and would I still do what I do now? I don't know, but I love it. I don't do anything I don't like or love. Mm. I do my life on my terms. Uh, and I love my life and I'm really proud of it. So, yeah, maybe. I just never like to think of the alternative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I've, I've got a good life. Um, blessed in so many ways. Um, so, yeah, and I've made a difference to people's lives. So, I yeah, I choose this. I love it. Taz, um, where can people find you, find Office Real Talk? Do you want to plug some socials? Yeah, like uh, you can, like for all work stuff and corporate stuff and me getting up to like normal banking stuff on LinkedIn, like Tasneem Bamji. But uh, you can find me on Instagram for Office Real Talk, uh, small but powerful, uh, and reach out and like slide into my DMs if you want to chat about anything as well. I'm always here to help. 100%. And guys, you know, if you've gotten to this point in the podcast, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, share, comment. Let us know how you found this conversation. To the future leaders, you're welcome. Uh. (laughs) Let us know if you acted this advice. And yeah, you know, this was um, another episode of What My Best Friend Does. If you didn't know, now you know. Now go and take some immediate action. Over and out.